Dr. Priscilla Samuel, you are the Chief Science Officer of Blue California. You've done some interesting research on uh, an amino acid that I honestly, I haven't heard of recently uh, called ergothionine. So I, I thought you'd be a perfect person to bring on board the podcast and talk about it uh, for those like myself who weren't really familiar with it until recently. Um, well, let's start our conversation by explaining what is ergothionine? Sure. First, thanks for having me on your uh, show. I appreciate it. Um, and so ergothionine is, um, it's an unusual amino acid. Um, it's, you're right, not very well known. Um, but uh, even though it was discovered about a century ago, um, there we are still under, trying to understand its physiological role in the body. Uh, it's a derivative of the amino acid histidine. Um, but it, interestingly, it is a potent antioxidant. Uh, and that's what makes it most interesting um, in terms of its role in the human body. That's really interesting. Can human beings make it? Is it something we make in our body naturally or we have to get it from food or supplements? Uh, no, uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we human bodies do not uh, make it. Um, we, uh, we don't have a way to make it. We do have to uh, get it from either dietary sources or from uh, supplemental sources. Um, and uh, so we do know that there are certain like, you know, certain bacteria, certain fungi, certain yeast um, that do synthesize it. And that's really how we can get it in, a, in our diet. So through natural diet resources, um, unless of course we get it through, um, you know, sources such as supplements that are, are made to, uh, to be ergothionine. Right. Since we don't make ergothionine the body is it a leap to maybe consider it an essential amino acid? It's not, on, it's not in any of the nutrition books I have, but it occurred to me since we don't make it, could it be considered quote unquote essential? Yeah, um, and so that's an interesting question. Um, so it doesn't fit the typical definition of an essential amino acid or even an essential vitamin. As you probably know, or you know, back in 2010, Paul and Snyder, from Johns Hopkins based on work that they had done, uh, suggested it be called a vitamin, um, but it doesn't meet the typical requirements uh, of a vitamin, meaning it doesn't show a disease state, for instance, within a short period of deficiency. Um, however, since then, uh, since more understanding of ergothionine has emerged with more research, um, back in 2018, uh, Dr. Bruce Ames suggested that we uh, call it, uh, you know, and accept it as a longevity vitamin. Um, you know, and the reason for this is even though our bodies can't make ergothionine, it appears that we have a transporter that is very specific to ergothionine. Um, and the fact that we have, you know, the essentiality that we have this specific transporter in the body for ergothionine that transports it from the gut to other parts of the body is what makes researchers and experts in this space propose that it be recognized as an essential nutrient and certainly as a longevity vitamin, which is what uh, the current uh, theory is and the proposal is in terms of recognizing the role and the importance of ergothionine, even though we continue to learn more about it and its physiological role in the body um, you know, as more science emerges. It's interesting. Yeah, I heard that term uh, bantied about longevity vitamin. Structurally, it looks what more like an amino acid than a vitamin, correct? Okay. That's right. So they're using kind of hyperbole when they say longevity vitamin, maybe more better longevity amino acid, perhaps. Right. Like yeah. vital health, right? Vitamin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so since we don't make it, we got to get it from food or supplements. What are some foods that contain ergothionine? Yes. So as I said, um, you know, certain fungi and yeast make it. So as a result, mushrooms are probably one of the best sources of ergothionine in the diet. Uh, now, not all mushrooms are, you know, the same in terms of their composition and content. Uh, King Boletus mushrooms, King oyster mushrooms, uh, these are some of the higher um, are the ones that have higher concentrations of ergothionine. Okay. Now, white button mushrooms also have, you know, which is the most, and I mentioned that because it's a fairly common mushroom consumed, especially in the American diet. 
Um, so white button mushrooms also are a source of ergothionine, but not as high as king boletus, so oyster mushrooms, etc. cetera. Uh, now, uh, interestingly, uh, things like uh, chicken liver, pork liver, kidney, pork kidneys, et cetera, also are a good source of ergothionine in the body, uh, partly because uh, ergothionine, um, you know, when you look at tissues from studies that are done, uh, you find that uh, liver is one of the high, um, you know, it, you know, is high in terms of its content because it gets stored there. Um, so that makes logical sense. Uh, things like oats and beans uh, also have ergothionine, um, but in very small levels. Good. And when you mentioned mushrooms, mushrooms are a fungus. And when I hear the word ergo, I think ergot, ergot the fungus, which grows yep. on rye and wheat. My mind immediately goes back to something I heard in childhood, a rumor, uh, it was a banty about back in, I guess, the 80s or the 70s, that ergot poisoning was associated possibly with the Salem witch trials. And for a trivia buff like me, I always key on, on weird facts like that. But so for the other people out there who are trivia buffs and they hear ergot and they hear hallucinations and stuff like that, which is what they were tracing back to the Salem witch trials 400 years ago, there are no hallucinations <laughs> with ergots or uh, ergothionine supplements, correct? No. Thank um, you for clearing that up. <laughs> Certainly, certainly none of the science to date okay. uh, that has been done uh, with the, the few clinical trials that we do know or do you know have published in the literature okay. don't certainly uh, report any of those kind of side effects, um, and um, you know and there are different parts of the world that consume uh, higher levels than we consume here in the U.S. and certainly we are not aware that that's uh, an issue. I didn't think it was either, but I knew I would hear from somebody eventually who would ask me about that. And I thought, let me just get this out of the way real fast. But um, I didn't think there was either, by the way. Um, what is the average intake of ergothionine in the American diet? Do we know that? Yeah, that's a good question. The average American diet um, actually has about one to one and a half, um, you know, um, milligram uh, in the diet. Um, about a four to five milligrams is more common in countries like Italy and some parts of Europe where certain types of mushrooms are consumed at higher, you know, higher uh, amounts in the diet. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, a very recent paper by Bielman um, et al. from Penn State, um, they actually looked at the association between the levels. Um, of uh, consumption across, you know, different parts of the world. And they found that there was uh, the lower levels, i.e. found in, um, you know, in the U.S. versus the higher levels in Italy were associated with um, higher levels of mortality, higher levels of morbidity, especially related to neurocognitive generative type, uh, degenerative type diseases, um, and lower life expectancy uh, versus those areas that have you know, higher levels uh, in the diet. So the levels overall range, appear to range in that ballpark. Now that doesn't mean that you, you know, you, you don't have a certain subset of the population in different parts of the world that might be consuming much higher levels based on what they're consuming in their diet. So for instance, uh, tempeh that's been fermented with uh, fungi uh, typically also has higher levels of ergothionine. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, if your diet consists of high, uh, higher amounts of various types of fungus or, um, you know, these fermented type foods that are fermented with fungi, et cetera, you might have a reasonably higher amount of ergothionine in your diet. So, so I, I guess there are low levels in the American diet, probably just another symptom of the, what they often call the standard American diet, the SAD, as I often see in, in the literature these days, isn't it sad we eat so poorly in America? Um, since since um, ergothionine is derived from histidine, another question I, I'm sure people would ask about is, if I took histidine supplements, could I raise my ergothionine levels? Has anybody looked into that? Yeah, um, no. So based on the existing science, mm -hmm. um, there is nothing that I can go from with regards to um, that we actually in the in in our human bodies convert histidine to ergothionine. I don't believe we actually have the metabolic pathway to do so. Um, and so no amount of histidine consumption is likely to increase ergothionine levels in the plasma and blood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it goes back to if we do um, want to have ergothionine and it appears to have, 
certainly important roles in the body as more science emerges, mm -hmm. it's important to get ergothionine as is, either from dietary or supplemental sources. Yeah, we, we live in a world of a lot of biohackers out there who is trying to find a, a shortcut to get where they're going to get to. And I thought, you know, when I, when I came across the, the relationship to histidine, I thought, well, let me ask that. But I wasn't sure if we were or not. So I'm glad you, you cleared that up. You, you mentioned that, that ergothionine has antioxidant properties. Is, is it proven in humans to have antioxidant effects or is that just a test tube in vitro studies? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So a fair number of studies are, um, you know, granted in vitro studies because of the way we uh, study antioxidant effects. Um, so what we do know is one of the chief roles, or certainly what experts believe is one of the chief roles for ergothionine is in fact its role as an antioxidant and as a cellular protectant in the body. Um, you know, i.e. protecting cells from various reactive oxygen species, um, you know, and as a result, um, you know, uh, we, uh, several different studies have looked at this in both in vitro, in animals, et cetera. And you, you see that ergothionine does in fact scavenge hydroxyl radicals, uh, which are fairly reactive and damaging to cells. They inhibit the production of oxidants from metal ions, for instance. Uh, they prevent the, you know, the formation of singlet oxygen. Um, you know, all in all, they protect from oxidative stress-induced uh, damage and cell death. Um, and in fact, the same group, Paul Snyder, uh, Paul and Snyder, back in 2010, uh, the group that you know proposed that ergothionine be called the vitamin initially, um, they actually studied HeLa cells and depleted them of the ergothionine transporter. And what they found was they saw a marked increase in oxidative stress and cell death, you know, certainly providing evidence uh, for a physiological role of the ergothionine transporter as well as ergothionine as an antioxidant, um, you know, in these cells. So there is also a very recent paper last year by uh, Borodina in 2020 um, that sort of uh, summarizes some of its uh, ergothionine's effects um, as a cytoprotectant, um, you know, via its effects uh, as an antioxidant and its effects through, uh, you know, inflammatory markers, et cetera. So, um, you know, be it lipid peroxidation, you know, uh, mitigating of cell injury, um, various models such as kidney fibrosis in mice that, you know, worsens when the transporter is removed. Um, so all of these are various effects that have been um, seen, um, you know, in the literature so far and reported in the literature. So interestingly though, when you kind of jump from that to health benefits or, you know, health and disease states, mm -hmm. ergothionine, as well as sources, high sources of ergothionine, i.e. the mushrooms, have been associated with cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. cognitive and neurodegenerative disorders, uh, prostate health, um, and many of these are associated, you know, with the underlying effects of oxidative stress and inflammation. So I think that provides additional, you know, um, substance and additional evidence for ergothionine's role as an antioxidant. Um, in fact, there are a couple of other studies as well um, with both mushrooms as well as, uh, you know, ergothionine itself. So for instance, there was a study published by a Swedish group in 2019 by Smith et al. Um, and they looked at many different biomarkers. It's a longitudinal study of more than 3000 individuals. And they looked at many different biomarkers and found that ergothionine was an independent marker that was associated with reduced mortality as well as decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the specific manner in which it does that was not necessarily you know, elucidated in this study, but it certainly uh, points to its potential role um, as an antioxidant. So also with uh, you know, um, neurodegenerative disorders where um, people with MCI, older people, elderly uh, subjects with MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, uh, have lower ergothionine levels in their blood. And this study was done in Singapore. Um, and um, we do know that these kinds of diseases, again, the, ox the underlying mechanism is uh, increased oxidative damage in the brain that plays a role, certainly, 
a significant role in the pathogenesis of these kinds of uh, neurodegenerative disorders, which again suggests that antioxidants such as uh, ergothionine might play an important role um, in um, these kinds of health states. Very interesting. You mentioned that it, it that ergothionine appears to have a cytoprotection role in the body, protecting the cells. And you mentioned the kidneys a little bit ago with, with some uh, laboratory animal research. I wondered when you said that, do we see an upregulation of this ergothionine transporter in diseased organs? I'm thinking liver, because in America right now, we have a kind of a, a deluge of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fat accumulates in the liver and it leads to, as you know, cirrhosis of the liver. And if it is a cell protectant, would we expect to see higher uh, transporter proteins in uh, organs of the body that are damaged? Am I looking at it from the wrong angle or am I on the right track? Um, yeah, I think, no, you're looking at it from the, uh, from the right angle. I think what we do need is, you know, certainly more uh, clinical studies okay. um, that look at these kinds of uh, effects um, in disease and non-disease states. Okay. Um, and we are at a stage where we don't have sufficient um, you know, uh, clinical studies um, to clearly point to that. But certainly what we do know is that from the different models that have been used, uh, we see that when the ergothionine transporter is uh, depleted or when it's, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you the, the researchers have used mechanisms to interfere with its uh, effects, you see enhanced um, you know, uh, lipid peroxidation, in enhanced oxidative stress, enhanced, um, you know, cell damage and cell death um, versus when cells are actually incubated um, with um, ergothionine. Um, so I think there's certainly a lot more to learn with specific disease states, um, you know, and uh, see how ergothionine plays a role in these disease states through its antioxidant effects. It's very, very interesting. Ergothionine is, if I remember correctly, a, a sulfur containing amino acid. And when I think of sulfur and I think amino and I think antioxidants, I gravitate towards glutathione, which as many people know is, you know, the master antioxidant in the body. Do we know how potentially ergothionine might compare or stack up against, say, glutathione? Has anybody looked at that? No, that's a good question, actually. Um, I can't remember exactly which paper, but um, there are a couple of studies that have looked at it and compared it versus glutathione. And there are a couple of reports where it's been reported as actually having effects that are stronger or more potent than glutathione. Really? That's really interesting. Are there, are there, are there laboratory animal studies or in vitro or human? In most, I believe for the most part, those were in vitro studies. Okay, interesting. Not human studies. Oh, well, unfortunately. Well, we'll bring you back when we have more, <laughs> we have more human studies. <laughs> and more to do. <laughs> yeah. um, we, you mentioned uh, ergothionine might be lo a longevity compound. And again, everybody's talking these days about, you know, living longer, living healthier, lifespan, health span. Can't talk about that without mentioning the mitochondria, which last time I checked was kind of a central target to this whole anti-aging uh, medicine uh, these days. Does, does the ergothionine amino acid play any role in helping the mitochondria stay healthy or have we not looked at that yet or? Yeah, so what we do know um, is that both ergothionine and the ergothionine transporter are concentrated in the mitochondria. Really? Okay. Um, suggesting, which is what suggests very specifically that it has a protecting, you know, role uh, of components in the mitochondria, such as DNA, um, you know, from say oxidative damage that's associated with uh, mitochondrial generation of, you know, various different uh, free radicals, uh, superoxide, etc. So, you know, and tissue levels are maintained uh, by the ergothionine transporter. So, uh, you know, this effect with DNA is what leads us to, you know, the uh, potential effects it has in telomeres, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, as you know, telomeres are the end sections of the chromosomes, uh, you know, they are basically non-coding sections of uh, the, you know, the DNA, um, and they are sort of uh, protective end caps 
of our chromosomes, similar to uh, the little plastic ends of shoelaces. Yes. Um, you know, and uh, you know, our study with ergothionine was, uh, in fact, uh, we decided to look at the effects of ergothionine as a result on these telomeres, uh, which are, you know, the end caps of. Uh, DNA, the, the, the chromosomes. Um, and because of its potential role that we know as an antioxidant, and therefore we know that telomeres shorten as a result of oxidative stress. And that is what we looked at in our study. So, so yeah, so going back to your question about mitochondria, um, we do know that ergothionine and this transport are both definitely concentrated in the mitochondria. It would make sense. There's a lot of free radicals coming off of that mitochondria as we process oxygen to make ATP. Um, again, again, you may not know the answer to this, but one of the big things these days in anti-aging supplements is to raise cellular NAD levels. People you know, say we have make less NAD as we get older and just make, make more of it and we'll get healthier. Is there any data out there in vitro, whatever, animal research that ergothionine might raise NAD levels? Um, good question. You're right. I have heard a, it's a fair amount of a buzzword now. Yeah. Um, no, I am not aware of any literature um, that shows that NAD might be uh, raised with uh, ergothionine. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean there may be something out there I'm not aware of, but I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Well, maybe maybe a study for future <laughs> future direction. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mentioned your study, yes, and again, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on, tell us about this very interesting study you did with telomeres, because telomeres, again, very popular in the world of anti-aging as well. You know, you, you nailed it with that classic definition of the, the telomeres being the, the, the caps on the end of shoelaces that they prevent the shoelaces from getting frayed, just as the telomeres might prevent our DNA from getting frayed and, you know, causing mutations and telomere shortening being in some circles thought to be maybe a sign of aging? Is that, is, is that actually, by the way, is that actually solidified? Is, is telomere shortening really, um, is, is it firmly uh, considered a, 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 a visible sign of aging or is it possibly a, well, what do you think? <laughs> Before I talk myself yeah. in a corner. No, that, that's an absolutely interesting question because uh, I believe uh, telomere shortening, um, now some shortening of telomeres obviously it, it happens with age, as we age, right? Mm -hmm. um, but telomere length um, serves as sort of an independent biomarker of cellular biological age, mm -hmm. which is really independent of chronological age. So mm -hmm. in other words, you can be old, but have cells in the body that are healthier than, you know, your chronological age. Yeah. Um, and this is where, you know, telomeres uh, come into play uh, because uh, they really uh, protect those cells. Um, and we know that many different disease states such as hypertension, hyperglycemia, obesity, um, you know, are associated with increased oxidation, oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, and, um, you know, these increase possibly um, the, there's been associated associ associations in the literature uh, with uh, increases in um, telomere shortening or rather uh, decreased telomere length uh, associated with these kinds of diseases. So potentially connected back with that oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, so, so yeah, is it important? It's, it's, it's pretty important uh, given that it appears to be sort of a growing a uh, body of evidence pointing it, uh, pointing to it being an independent biomarker. Very, very interesting. And your study was in vitro, if I remember right. You essentially bathed uh, red, what uh, tel uh, bathed uh, cells in ergothionine and measured their telomere length. Is, is did, I, my, did I read that correctly? Or yes, yes. So um, I'll give you a gist of what we did. Mm -hmm. um, so the objective, as I mentioned a little earlier, the objective was to determine if ergothionine can reduce telomere shortening. <clears throat> so again, because of its ant known antioxidant properties. So in this study, what we did is we looked at oxidative stress conditions and we looked at standard conditions. Um, it was an in vitro study. Um, we cultured neonatal dermin, uh, dermal uh, fibroblasts. Um, and uh, this is an established model uh, to look at telomeres because um, you can observe the normal cellular aging uh, process, and they sort of have a lifespan of about two months, which is perfect. 
Um, and so the cells were treated with ergothionine, different concentrations of ergothionine, ranging from 0.04 to uh, one milligram per mil of ergo. And we looked at it over that course of eight weeks. Uh, assessments were looked at at zero, four, and eight weeks. And we measured telomere length, telomere shortening, percent of short telomeres, um, et cetera. So basically what we found in this in vitro study where we used Blue California's uh, ergoactive uh, ergothionine, um, under oxidative stress conditions, uh, what we found that there was a significantly reduced rate of shortening. That rate of shortening was reduced by 27 to 52%. Um, there was, it resulted in longer median telomere length across all doses tested by about eight weeks. It also reduced the percent of short telomeres at both eight and four weeks across all doses. Um, so they, interestingly, we also saw an increase. We looked separately um, at telomerase activity, which is the enzyme that's responsible for adding DNA sequences mm -hmm. to the ends of telomeres and maintaining their length. Um, we did see increased telomere, uh, telomerase activity as well with ergothionine. Um, so when you look at all those results across the board, so to say, the, sh the reduced shortening rate, the increased, um, you know, telomere length that was maintained, uh, preser or rather preserved, um, and the percent of short telomeres that was much lower uh, with ergothionine-treated um, cells. Um, it suggests that ergothionine helps preserve uh, the telomere length under oxidative conditions, which is really important, um, thus potentially, uh, you know, supporting healthy aging. Um, you know, and from a growing body of evidence, we do know that various nutritional components have been studied for these effects. Um, the results have not been always consistent, um, but uh, it does certainly uh, point to additional data that nutritional components can uh, and may potentially uh, help maintain and preserve telomere length um, and therefore the age of cells and, you know, help them from going senescent uh, or, you know, cell death too soon. So interesting. So your study showed that your ergoactive ergothionine supplement, it, it slowed down the shortening of the telomeres, which is very impressive, yep. but it also appeared to increase the telomerase enzyme, which is associated with building those telomeres back up, correct? Yes. That's interesting. So potentially a future study maybe carried out longer might potentially show a elongation of telomere length? Yeah, that's an interest. So, so that's an interesting question. Um, you know, what we saw was preservation of telomere length, um, and could it potentially increase telomere length? Uh, I think that's a good question for us to ask in another study. Um, you know, we do hope to um, certainly do some human uh, clinical work in the future as well, uh, but potentially uh, additional work. Um, you know, certainly uh, begs the question of whether or not it can actually increase telomere length. Now that I'm not aware of too many nutrients that actually do that. As I mentioned, the data is somewhat inconsistent in that manner as well. But, um, you know, preserving telomere length uh, has been seen with things like omega-3s, vitamin C, vitamin E. Uh, but increasing telomere length, I think, um, sort of is an interesting aspect to continue to study with various nutrients. Yeah, yeah. Again, when I when I hear telomere shortening, I think about telomere elongation and what what are the yeah. ramifications of that. Uh, so, so yeah, I'd love to see a future a future study take a look at that. Ergoactive is the Blue California supplement. How is ergoactive different than ergothionine that someone may find in a mushroom, for instance? Um, ergoactive is the branding uh, of Blue California uh, for our ergothionine ingredients. So. Uh, Blue California is a science-based manufacturer of ingredients um, that play in the food, beverage, supplement, uh, personal care, and cosmetic industries. Um, and so our ergothionine could potentially, um, you know, play in many of those different worlds. Um, it's produced uh, through a proprietary fermentation manufacturing process. So it's not necessarily extracted from, you know, mushrooms. It is produced, um, you know, through a proprietary process. 
Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's basically the same compound at the end of the day, uh, but it's our ingredient that's sold into uh, these different industries and can be used in these different industries. And that is how someone would be able to uh, get a supplemental source, for instance, of ergothionine in their diet. Gotcha, gotcha. Getting back to the telomere shortening, has it, again, you may not know the answer to this, but my mind wanders as, as we talk about these, these very interesting topics. Has ergothionine or ergoactive been shown to uh, slow down telomere shortening in all cell types or only, yeah. I think you used red blood cells, if I remember correctly? Um, we used a neonatal dermal, dermal uh, fibroblasts. So, so, so. Um, so most, that's a good question. Most cells in the body have a nucleus that contain DNA. Mm -hmm. What we know based on the science to date, we know that um, ergothionine is transported from the gut Mm -hmm. uh, to many different tissues in the body. So conceivably, it's possible that ergo may help preserve telomere length in those cells where it is present. Um, you know, now in this study, we used the neonatal human fibroblast as a model, um, but you know, we, I can't say for sure that it actually happens in all cells, but conceivably where erg ergothionine is, it could play this role. Um, you know, that we know as it relates to uh, telomere length um, and telomere shortening. That's very, very interesting. Because, you know, because the other thing is, you know, telomere shortening is accelerated uh, by inflammation and oxidative stress. Right. Um, and what we do know is ergothionine is present in those tissues that see increased oxidative stress, um, you know, and inflammation as well. So um, it's, it's a very interesting association and uh, there's certainly a lot more to be, uh, you know, learned along those lines. Are there any known or theoretical si side effects potentially of ergothionine supplementation? Is there anybody who maybe may not want to take it? I'm thinking. Uh, no, there are no known um, or no reported okay. uh, side effects, certainly no negative side effects of ergothionine. Okay. Um, and the safety um, levels and the safety buffer is really pretty large. Uh, the NOEL, which is the, um, you know, uh, a marker that uh, regulatory bodies look for in terms of safety is 800 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. Wow. So as you can see, it's really, really high. And so uh, there are no uh, negative effects that have been reported. I was, I was thinking, I'm a worst case scenario guy. So when I, I again, we were talking telomere shortening, I was going to the worst possible case of everything, which would be cancer. Is it possible that ergothionine might slow down the telomere shortening of cancer cells? And what ultimately would that mean? Again, I'm, I'm, my mind is, is drifting in all kinds of different directions as we're speaking. Uh, and I'm also trying to anticipate the questions that people would ask me down the road. So, uh, but there's been nothing, no one's ever looked at the effect of uh, uh, cancer cells and, and ergothionine or, or is, the, is the ergothionine transporter present in cancer cells? Do we even know that? That's a good question, actually. I don't really know the answer to the question of whether or not the ergothionine transporter is present in cancer cells. Um, I don't believe um, ergothionine has been looked at with respect to cancer cells. I'm not aware okay. of a study along those lines. Okay, that's yeah. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think you would be because I again I had not heard of it. But I, again, people would ask me these questions, and you know much more about this stuff than I do. Um, yeah. The, the only cancer connection that we do know of, in fact, is uh, the prostate, uh, prostate health and prostate cancer, uh, where the Japanese study actually saw, uh, saw a, a, a positive effect, meaning a beneficial effect of ergothionine uh, in the diet associated with better prostate health um, you know, and lower prostate cancer. Uh, this was a Japanese uh, study, I believe. Um, but in terms of specifically looking at uh, cancer, be it in vitro models or human studies, I'm not aware of any kind of clinical work. Do we know an optimal dosage of ergothionine at this point? I know Americans take it a lot less than, say, their European counterparts. Has anybody looked at optimal dosages yet, or do we even have an idea? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so as you know, dose is always going to be related to some kind of a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from having worked on many different areas of health and disease uh, in my past so far, um, I would say that, you know, the likelihood of a dose connected to a benefit, it could be, it could be many different levels, right? It could be a, a different dose for a different benefit. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. What we we don't know um, enough of optimal doses across different, say, benefits, because we don't have enough of clinical studies, so to, so to say. Mm -hmm. However, going back to um, the Beelman work that I mentioned a few uh, minutes ago that was just published um, last year, you know, um, I think a general good dose to start with might be a five to 10 milligram a day. Um, given what, uh, you know, Beelman published with the, you know, the higher levels of the five milligram being associated with higher mortality, uh, you know, and the lower levels, uh, rather the lower levels being associated with higher mortality, higher morbidity from the neurological type disorders, um, and the lower life expectancy. And with the US being at one milligram and parts of Europe being at five milligrams, um, I think, you know, uh, a five to 10 milligram dose might certainly be a good dose to start with um, until we see more uh, clinical studies that uh, test for uh, higher doses. Um, you know, the regulatory uh, bodies, uh, so for instance, the EFSA, um, the EU uh, approval for ergothionine allows for up to 30 milligrams in supplements. Um, so it wouldn't be uncommon, um, you know, or it wouldn't be surprising to find a, a higher dose in some supplements, um, you know, so, it, you know, depending on what someone is aiming for and what, um, you know, one wants to take a, a stab at in terms of health, um, I think it's, um, uh, it, it could be important to start somewhere with a 5 or 10 or perhaps a little higher even. Um, more, a lot of the studies so far the epi work have associated blood levels um, with um, ergothionine. So for instance, the um, <clears throat> ergothionine blood levels with various disease states, for instance, the Smith study that I mentioned that was published in 2019, that looked at about 3,200 or so adults. It was a longitudinal study. They looked at 112 you know, different biomarkers. Um, and of those 112 biomarkers, um, they reported that ergothionine uh, was an important biomarker and that was an in independent biomarker uh, that showed decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and reduced mortality. Um, my guess is that, you know, that group might be following up hopefully on more additional studies. I haven't been in touch with them necessarily, um, but there was another uh, group uh, also out of Japan that also studied uh, ergothionine blood levels um, as it relates to frailty, um, you know, and found that um, those individuals who were older, so these were among elderly uh, uh, population who were older and had markers of frailty, markers of, uh, you know, reduced, um, you know, cognition um, and also hypomobility. Uh, they also uh, had uh, reduced levels of um, ergothionine. Ergothionine, again, in this particular study was also found to be a marker and they suggested that it was a neuroprotective uh, antioxidant uh, based on what they found uh, in, this, in, the literature, in their study as well. So I think the literature continues to improve and continues to grow uh, for ergothionine as it relates to various health benefits uh, as I mentioned, you know, cardiovascular disease, various different um, neurodegenerative diseases, um, you know, health states, um, you know, uh, improved health, you know, from protection against oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, these are various reasons for why ergothionine uh, might be valuable to look at more closely um, in terms of uh, its potential essentiality, really, uh, in the body, uh, especially in light of that very unique transporter that we seem to have, um, you know, and the fact that we can't make it. Yeah, definitely. You, you mentioned, again, as we were talking, ergothionine has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. Mm -hmm. And we know both of these can play a role in wrinkles. Has anybody studied ergothionine in terms of wrinkles? Because I've seen creams <laughs> that, that actually contain ergothionine and are being marketed as anti-wrinkle creams. Have we seen anything about anti-wrinkles yet? Has it, can it erase wrinkles? Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, I haven't actually looked at the literature very closely uh, for the, the wrinkle uh, part. I do know that ergothionine is, is approved in certain parts of the world for use in cosmetics. 
Um, there are studies that show um, that it is, it, because of its antioxidant properties, um, it protects, uh, you know, the skin cells uh, from damage, um, you know, does it specifically improve wrinkle outcomes? I would have to look into that. Yeah, yeah makes sense. But, um, and along the same sort of lines, as I was investigating earth ergothionine, I came across people asking this question, can ergothionine help hair loss? And it, it was, it, it, I read it and I thought, I wouldn't understand a mechanism how it would except anti-inflammatory and maybe doing something along those lines. But has anybody looked at hair loss and ergothionine? I'm not aware of any studies along the lines of hair loss. Okay. Um, the work for the cosmetics is really about UV protection, mm. um, you know, in on skin, skin cells. Nice. Um, but uh, hair loss, no, I'm not aware of anything. Right. I'll certainly look into that after, after we're done with our call. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I like doing my podcast is I, I really think that university research is underutilized. And I try to put my, myself in the shoes of some graduate student thinking, what am I going to do a dissertation on? And so sure. in, my, in my podcast, I usually start throwing out these little ideas because if I was rich, I would hire people to do this research for me. <laughs> and I'm kind of hoping that people listen and say, hey, that's a great dissertation topic. So yes. uh, Indeed. Yeah, maybe we get them some ideas today, perhaps. Um, Absolutely. I certainly hope that more students would, uh, you know, get thinking, uh, you know, get their thinking around ergothionine and develop some dissertations. Totally. I would be for that. Yeah, as would I, because as you said, it's been, it, it was discovered over a century ago. And when I, when I was perusing through the research, I kept thinking to myself, why is there not more studies on this with people? We've known about this for over 110 years, if not more. Where, where's more of human research? So again, this is a burgeoning uh, area for some uh, entrepreneurial college student thinking about, you know, what they want to do their PhD dissertation on or even their master's thesis. So I know, I know I wish I was back in school so I could do a lot more of this research myself. So mm -hmm. this is a, this has been a fantastic interview. I really appreciate your time and your patience with some of my off the wall questions, Dr. Samuel. <laughs> um, wh where can people learn more about Ergo Active and Blue California? Do you, do you make your own supplement or do you license it out to other companies? And how can people identify it if they are looking for uh, an ergothionine supplement? Yeah. Um, so with regards to how can, how can people find uh, ergothionine, um, you know, it, basically, Ergothionine supplements uh, are sold on Amazon, uh, given most people are shopping online these days. It's uh, probably a good place to start. Um, uh, our ergoactive ergothionine is sold into the supplement world and can be found in supplements that are sold in, on, our, on Amazon. Okay. Um, now, what was your second next question along those lines? How, what would people be looking for? Would, they, would the supplement always say ergoactive? If they were oh. looking for a supplement, because you guys did the research. So, you know, I'm a research guy myself. So if I'm, if I'm thinking about a supplement, I would rather go with the product that actually has some research on it. Yeah. Um, so I believe there might be products that actually are brand named as well, uh, you know, that carry our brand name rather uh, for the ergothionine source in the supplement. So they could certainly look for ergoactive on those supplements uh, that carry the brand name. Um, and they will likely also found, find other supplements that um, are not using uh, the ergo uh, active uh, branding. Now, as you probably know, um, even though some companies, be it food, beverage, or supplement, and I've spent about half my career in you know CPG goods and half my career in ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, Companies don't always necessarily carry the branding, so it can be frustrating for somebody when they're looking for a branded ingredient. Um, so I would say look for ergothionine, certainly look for ergoactive, um, and you're likely to find it on some supplements. Now, for more information um, on ergothionine, um, you know, um, while Google is a good place, uh, they can certainly um, come to the Blue California website as well. Uh, it's uh, www.bluecal-ingredients.com and they would be able to find more information on ergothionine and we continue to try and populate it with additional information. Fantastic. And I'll definitely link to Blue California in the episode notes for the podcast uh, and on YouTube as well so people can find you very easily. 
Dr. Priscilla Samuel of Blue California, this has been a very, very interesting interview. Again, I greatly appreciate your patience and your time today. Uh, is there anything further you wanted, to, you wanted to say anything to the audience? Talk, look into us and listen to us right now. No, I would say the only thing I want to add is, you know, uh, keep your pulse on ergothionine. Um, it certainly is, uh, you know, an interesting amino acid, uh, not very well known. Um, and that's one reason to, you know, keep your pulse on it, because I believe that is the science is growing, um, you know, for it to, to have to, for our understanding in order for us to know more and more about it as it relates to its key role in the body. Um, so, you know, uh, I will certainly uh, look forward to uh, the additional opportunity to tell you more about uh, ergothionine as we do additional studies as well on ergothionine and as we get more results on ergothionine as it relates to uh, various different benefits uh, along the lines of health and well-being. Uh, but it certainly at the moment uh, appears to be uh, an important nutrient, potentially an important nutrient for healthy aging and healthy living. Um, so, um, you know, um, stay, stay abreast on ergothionine. Fantastic. And I'm definitely, I, I absolutely will. You know, so, uh, cause I'm, I'm fascinated by the research. So again, I can't thank you very much and, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a bunch for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for your interest in ergothionine and blue California's ergo active ergothionine. Thank you very much. Thanks.